Welcome to a closer look with Mark Shine and Mark Miller, and this is our Christmas, Christmas show. show. Yes, very festive behind us. You got red on. Good I do. for you. And if you poke me right now, like in a vein, like you're trying to draw blood, you draw sugar. Oh, <laughs> there you Christmas go. Stuff going on in my house. All right, lots of basketball to get to. Let's review some games from last week, and I, I guess you start. I got with OG. it. I yeah. got it. How about Ottawa Glendorf and Lima Central Catholic last Saturday night over at Lima Central Catholic? What a great high school basketball game. On Friday night, OG came from nine down in the fourth quarter to beat St. Mary's 64-50 with a 31-8 quarter. LCC won on Friday night, too. They beat Jefferson 58-36. This is closely contested all the way. LCC leads by one at the end of the first quarter. OG leads by one at halftime. A really nice third quarter by Lyman Central Catholic. They lead 46-38 heading into the fourth quarter. But once again, OG rallies, this time behind seven points from Ethan White and five from Jake Dibble in the fourth quarter. They outscore LCC 17 to five. A nice basketball game for LCC. Big Johnson had a great game handling the basketball. He had 10 points, Raul Samaru had 11, Janowski had 12. OG, for the first time all year, did not make a three-point field goal during the course of the game. The 70th meeting, and now they're tied at 35 wins apiece between these two schools. And good news, a Jay Kaufman sighting for OG. He's on the bench there. and. Sorry, warmed up with him a little bit. Hope to get Jay back sometime soon. That's right. Be great to see him healthy again. Let's yep. go to the MAC. Delphi St. John's 48, Fort Recovery 45 for St. John's. Jared Worst had 20 points, hit four threes. That puts the Blue Jays at three and two, one and one in the league because they opened up early against for sales. They have Van Wert coming up this Friday. That'll be a tough game for Fort Recovery. Peyton Judy had 26 points, hit a couple of threes. Saturday night, they came back in a good win and beat Jay County 46-44. Their record is 4-1. They've got that one loss in the MAC, and they play tonight against South Adam. How about Corey Ross and that Liberty Benton? December 12, 1986, Corey Ross in 53, Liberty Benton 51. That's the last time Corey Rosson defeated Liberty Benton in basketball 31 years ago. Great start for Corey Rosson. They lead 15 to six after one. LB rallies, but the fourth quarter, it's all Corey Rosson. They will take a 15 to 11 fourth quarter. Eric Ritter, 17 points. Uh, he had a six in the fourth quarter, as did Tommy Stoffer. Uh, Stoffer also had nine rebounds. Uh, then Ritter had a big game on Saturday night as well for them as they lost to Temple Christian at 38 with five three-point field goals. LB. Short from football season, not much practice time to get guys hurt. May didn't play in this game. The LB lost again on Saturday night to Ottawa Hills. They're 0-3 for the first time in a long time and looking to rebound. Great win for Corey Ross. And let's look at Miller City and Lipsick. Miller City wins at 57-50. For Miller City, Mitchell Gable had 17. Noah Otto had 14 with four threes. And Tyler Schrader had 13. Nice even scoring there. They beat Paulding last night, 72-58. That's their third win in a row. So they got it rolling. They are 4-2, 1-0 in the league. They are at Wayne Trace on Friday night. Lipsick, Tyler Hegel had 13. But Friday, he had 27 with six threes and a loss to North Baltimore. That puts them at 1-4, oh, and 1 in the league. And they play Maumee tomorrow night. All right, let's move on to our stat stuff. There you Bart. go. Let's go on there. Tanner Schrader from Macomb. He had 33 with seven threes and a win over Van Loo, 70 to 55. He came back on Saturday night, 11 more points, three threes in that particular game. That was a loss to Bluffton, 55-61. And Macomb has road games this weekend at Liberty Center and at North Baltimore. Minster beat Wapak 61-57. Mike Kentner had 18, he had four threes. And teammate Jared Schultz, he had 18 in that game. It's a little bit of a surprise. You know, Mr. Yeah. nobody knew anything about it. They hadn't played right. any games because of their football state championship and beat a good Wapak team by yeah. four. That's a good win for them. Yeah. Jamal Whiteside from Perry had 25 in a 69-43 win over Ada. And now Perry starts their WBL schedule. They have Shawnee on Tuesday night. They have Bath at Bath on the 23rd. And then on the 27th, they have Wapak Connect at home. These are three very difficult games for Perry. Whiteside's playing well for them right now. Oh, you're very funny, that WBL thing. I, I thought you made a mistake, but I should have known better. <laughs> hey, Noah Howell from Temple had 30 points and six threes in their win over Corey Ross, and they beat him 76 to 66. How about that? Ryan Roth from Finley had a big weekend. They beat Clay on Friday night. Roth had 16 with four threes in the win over Clay. Then he had 25 with five threes and a 
34 win over Bath. Uh, this weekend, they've got uh, Fremont Ross on the road and then a home game with Defiance through the Finley Trojans. Let's look at Daniel Unruh from Elida. We talk about him a lot. He had another good weekend. Friday night, he had 16, including four threes, and their win over Bath, 60-44, to came back on Saturday night, had 23 with seven threes, and their win over Coldwater, 67-50. to All right, and Jacoby Kelly from Van Wert. Mark, you know you talk about guys that you, know, you just can't guard him. Wapak Connecticut could not guard Jacoby Kelly. He had... 29 points, he had two threes in the game, he takes the ball to the basket with great strength. He was all over the floor, helped them rally from a 10 point deficit, got it cut to two. Jacoby Kelly had a great game and he's gonna be a load for anybody to handle in the Western Buckeye League this year. All right, it's time for our bright spot and you know we like yep. good sportsmanship. We try to point it out and Mark found a good one. We did, this was in that same game, Van Ward and uh, the game with, with the other night with Wapak. Watch the offensive foul right here. Officials called it. And Nick Schoonover says, you know what, I just made a mistake. I used my elbow to clear some space. I don't like what I just did in a hotly contested game. He walks up to Kelly. They embrace each other. Let's move on and play. A great example of sportsmanship. Let's take a look at it again. Here's the foul. Good call, first of all. He gets his elbow up and right there and then goes, you know what, that's an error, and I'm a sportsman, I'm going to show it. They walk up and they shake hands. That's a great play by both yeah, players. Good job, Nick. Yes, sir. All right, it's time for Where Are They Now? And Mark's been highlighting some college basketball players in our area, and boy, we got a good one to talk well, about Well, we tonight. do, and, and for the first time, and probably many times this year, we're going to talk about a Finley Oiler because they got some local guys playing really well for Finley. We're going to look at Taryn Sullivan. Taryn Sullivan is now 6'6", 220, and he's a oh. senior at Finley. And he has had a great career there, obviously, so far. He started at Bath, of course. Remember when he was a Wildcat? A couple of, of appearances in the regionals, a couple of all-district teams. Also a good baseball player there. But now they're in the, he's up at Finley. He's in his fourth year there. There's a dunk by Taryn. How about right now? Let's, let's look at him from a year ago. A year ago, he was second team all-region by the National Ath uh, Basketball Coaches Association. He led his team in rebounding, steals, blocks, field goal percentage, and three-point field goals. He was also averaged 18.1 points per game a year ago. This year, Finley, the, they are 11 and two right now. The Oilers, six and zero in conference play. They have a Tuesday night game with Alderson Broadus, and then they play the 28th against Goshen. Right now, Terrence Sullivan averaging 30 and a half minutes per game, 18.2 points per game, 6.8 rebounds, 3.4 assists. He's shooting 42.5 from the three-point line and making over 83% of his free throws. The Oilers are playing well, and he's a part of that right now. It's killing me watching him back that? in high school. He's yeah. a skinny kid that shot from his from his shoulder. Boy, has he evolved and become a good basketball You know, player. you talk about evolve because when he left Bath, there was people going, you know what, I don't know whether his motor runs enough to play at Finley. He got up there, got some coaching, and mature as a man both on the floor and, and in his attitude and so on, and he is a fine, fine basketball player right now. He sure is. All right, it's time for me to learn rule of the week. And this week, Coach Shine's going to talk about the referees and what they do pregame. Well, I thought we'd do something a little bit different this week. What happens to the officials? You know, in, in football, you look at the crew, right? Yep. Same guys every week. Well, in basketball, a little bit of that. But typically, you come in with a new group of guys every week. So what happens? Well, the first thing is we go in the locker room and we decide who is the referee tonight and who is going to toss the jump ball. Some guys like to do that. Some guys don't. I worked with a guy last year. It was January and said, you know what, I haven't tossed all year. I'm not starting tonight. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> but they're going to talk about, they talk about coverage areas. Everybody has a primary area you're responsible for on the floor and a secondary area. They remind each other of that and a little bit of team scouting as in this team presses or that team gets out, runs in transition or not. Let's make sure we're prepared for that. That's part of it. They go on the floor, typically with about 15 minutes to 14 minutes to go in the warm-up period. And what are they doing? Well, they're surveying the gym. Is there anything odd or unusual here we need to be aware of? And we're looking at the teams as they warm up for uniform violations and dunking. Okay, got to keep them from dunking a basketball. Obviously, that's the rule book now. With 12 minutes to go on the clock, they're going to meet with the captains of both teams. And that can be anything. It could be as short as shake hands. Fellas, what do you think? Let's play. Two, okay, visiting team, here are the out-of-bounds lines. Here's where you need to be aware of those type of situations. Here's what we're going to officiate tonight. We're not going to let you jump over the back. Uh, we're not going to let you set illegal screens. We're going to play defense with your feet, not your hands. It could be something lengthy like that. And they just remind the captains that, you know, you're going to help your teammates and be in support of the situation right there. Okay, at 10 minutes to go, the head referee and his two partners, if they want, go across the floor, and they're going to look at the scorebook. They have a couple things to do there. They're going to inspect and improve all the equipment. That includes the clock and designated official timepiece. Look at the basketball to make sure it's got enough air in it, all those types of things. 
They had to look at the possession arrow. Uh, does that work this evening? They're going to find out who is responsible for notifying the teams. There's three minutes left in the warm-up period and three minutes left at halftime. Typically, it's the official timer. Sometimes it's an AD or somebody like that. But somebody has to go to the locker room and remind both coaches, hey, there's three minutes left either until the game starts or until we get into the second half. They designated an official scorebook and a scorekeeper. And why did they do it with 10 minutes to go? Because your roster has to be set with 10 minutes to go, and you have to have your starting lineups in the book by the time there's 10 minutes left on the clock. So they're checking all those types of things, and they sign the scorebook right there. And then finally, with two minutes to go, they all go over and they shake hands with the coaches, typically with the visiting coach first. They, ver they verify that the team is legally and properly equipped and that they will demonstrate good sportsmanship with the head coach. They do the same thing with the other coach, and then they remind both coaches, of course, hey, when you call a timeout, let us know right away. Do you want a 30-second timeout? Do you want a full timeout? Do that, uh, as a, and of course, shake hands and wish them good luck and Merry Christmas and all those kinds of so things. So they don't just show up and toss the ball in the air and play ball? They right? do not. A There's lot some, of work to do pregame. So, some of those pregame meetings, like when they get together in the locker room, some of them are quite lengthy. If you haven't worked with guys for a while mm -hmm. and you want to make sure everybody's on the same page, we talked last year about avoiding the dreaded blarge. You know, if we get two whistles at the same mm -hmm. time, let's get together and straighten it out. And they talk about coverage areas, and uh, it's more than just saying, hey, how are the wife and kids and things at work? Sure. Yeah, there, there's some things that go on there. All right. Good job. Hey, one another segment that Mark uh, is going to add, and, and we will as we go throughout the winter of the basketball season, is interviewing different kinds of people that have to do with game administration and, and all that kind of stuff, instead of just coaches and maybe sometimes players. And Mark ran into uh, Brad Rex, athletic director at Wapak, and you got a chance to talk to him about some things. I did. I, I wanted to do, what do athletic directors do? You know, we see them on game day at football games or at basketball games. What do they do and what's the things like for them, and particularly for Brad? Now that we've got Christmas vacation coming up, what's it like at Christmas vacation as well? This is kind of an interesting interview. Take a look. Let's look on the road. We're with the athletic director of Wapak High School, Mr. Brad Rex, and we want to get a little insight on what it's like to do his job. Brad, you have 22 boys basketball games. Nine of them are scheduled by the league. What, go, what goes into making up the rest of the schedule? Well, you know, you, obviously 13 uh, non-league games is a whole lot as an AD, and then you think about girls basketball has 22 games, and you've got wrestling matches in the gym. So you're trying to have to, it's a puzzle, really, and you take out holidays, Sundays, Wednesdays, because we don't play on those. And, as you know, no basketball coach wants to play on Monday. So you try to figure out what open dates you can find. Uh, luckily, from year to year, once you have it set, it's generally the same. It's uh, those games like when we have Marion Local and we have to reschedule it. We yeah. have to try to find a date. You know, we're going to play them on a Monday night this year, which isn't ideal because we're playing Friday, Saturday night, the week before. But, um, you know, it's very difficult and a challenge to get 22 games in. And, and you played New Year's Eve last year. We did play New Year's Eve. And honestly, if I could play New Year's, Day, New Year's Eve every year, yeah. I would because it was very good turnout. It, it was a very good game. And uh, people aren't going out till later, so it was. It turned out really well uh, to play on that New Year's Eve. Yeah, and it's not just boys basketball though. Like you said, it's everybody you got to try to go and schedule the gym right, too. Right, right. We've got yeah. girls basketball, we got wrestling, and then you know when a, when a team leaves us, drops us, whatever, we're not going to play them anymore. Uh, the first thing I do is go to the coach and say, hey, what teams would you like to see us get on our schedule? Because they're the ones that know better. And and me personally, I have to play the best. You know, <laughs> yeah. I think. Right. If you're going to be good, you got to play the best. So I go to them right away and say, what teams around within driving distance would you like to play? And then we try to find out. And, you know, the other teams, they'll have league nights different than ours. So it really becomes a challenge looking, uh, looking to find a date that we can yeah. play on. Everybody sees you walking around the gym here tonight, but your day started this morning, and, and it's going to end when they turn the lights out here. Yeah. What's your day like? Well, you know, uh, people ask me that a lot. And uh, for me to answer that, it's, it's difficult because there's so many things that goes into my job. Uh, a lot of times you'll have something planned to say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show up and do this today, and somebody comes in, and next thing you know, you're not doing yeah. that that day. So I would say a portion of my day is definitely set aside for uh, unscheduled time with coaches. Uh, coaches come in, they want to talk about the night before, they want to talk about an issue with the kid, or, or just talk in general, and, and that's one of the great parts of my job. I enjoy doing that. Um, so that's part of the day, and I spend a lot of part of the day um, looking at my schedule, making sure I've got everything set up and ready to go because as an AD, we have uh, 22 varsity sports, not including the lower levels. So you put the lower levels in there, and I've done this before. We have over 800 events in a year. Over 300 of those are at home. Uh -huh. And then you factor in most of those take officials, anywhere from one to eight officials we have. So yeah. 
it is a lot of pieces in there, and so I spend a lot of time checking and rechecking schedules, officials, game workers, game help, making sure we got everything ready yeah. to go. And when an official doesn't show, oh boy. And when an official yeah. doesn't show, you're, <laughs> that's you, the problem. Yeah, yeah, it's it's difficult to do because everybody, with the lack of officials we have, they're right. working. Yeah. So it's not like you can call somebody up and and find somebody to do that. So it is a it is a challenge to say the least, and uh, I, I find it trying to be organized and prepared and is your best avenue. Well. Everybody else in your school is going on Christmas break. The AD's not. What's your Christmas look like? It, it's busy. Uh, we have a game on the 21st to 22nd, and, and kids get out on the 20th. Uh, the 23rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th, I do not have games. 27th, the boys are back. The 28th, we've got a girls' tournament. Somehow I figured out not, <laughs> not to have a game on the 29th, so a Friday night I've got off. Then on 30, the 30th, I pay for it. i got a freshman game at 10, a JV boys game at 1, followed by the varsity against Delphus Jefferson. And then that evening, we've got a girls uh, TSC holiday tournament. So the 30th is gonna be a pretty crazy it, day it, for me. And then, uh, you know, the 31st, obviously right. Sunday's off, the first off, and then we have games starting again on the fourth. So, uh, yeah, not a not a real great break for me, but it could be worse. And, and the family plays an important part there, doesn't it? They really do, yeah. That, tomorrow night, we've got a uh, family Christmas that I'm gonna miss at least half of because of a game, but yeah, everybody right. understands. and. My wife and kids are uh, yeah. do, a, do a good job with uh, understanding. Well, Brad, you were an athlete, you were a coach, you were a great competitor. Where do you find your success as an athletic director? Well, you know, and, and I got into education to help kids, and uh, I think everybody would say that's the reason we got into this. And I, I truly, I love athletics. You know, I, I played for you. you I, did. I enjoyed doing that. Um, so I think athletics is a very valuable part of the educational process. Uh, and what it can teach kids, I, I just uh, I believe in wholeheartedly. You know, teamwork and and hard work and uh, respect for opponents. Yep. You know, and I think athletics does all of those things. And so, when our kids go out and compete and they're able to shake everybody's hand at the end of the night, I feel proud. Well, there's a lot of good athletic directors around. This is one of the brastest. Brad Rex from Wapak High School. Mark and I are going to take a break right now. When we come back, we'll be at the big board and look at the plays of the week. You're watching a closer look on WOSN. Segment number two at the big screen, and Coach Shine's going to start off with a play from the LCC game. Well, we talked about how this was such a competitive game. Watch the LCC hustle on this play right here. There's a penetration dribble that's going to take place as we get our screen started, and watch how Johnson and then Garner play hustle basketball. Tip the ball loose right here. Here comes uh, Trey Garner in to steal the basketball, and then off goes Johnson in transition. He's going to get fouled as well right there. You can see the crowd reaction. Uh, this was a, a type of game it was. The hustle play, tip it loose right there, scramble after it, dive on the floor. It was this type of basketball game, wrestle it loose, and off he goes in transition. Then it's going to get that score down at the other end and the one right there. And I thought Biggs Johnson really played well in this game. That's the type of hustle it was. Then we're going to look at a couple plays, Mark, because uh, uh, as a post player, I just like how we post up in this game. We don't often do that anymore, but this is Dybul. Work, 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 and finally throw it in a third time. He catches and scores. Uh, and we don't post up often enough anymore, but watch what happens. This is three consecutive post-entry passes, one from Hegel. Then Knowlton throws it back up on top. They repost him down inside again. Here the defense collapses. Watch the three ball fake. Watch all the defenders go to rebound. And the, the third pass down inside the score and the foul. This is when the, uh, the Titans started going because they started throwing it inside. Here's a set play for Dybul. They ran the clear out, got a shot for him posting up inside. Here comes the offensive player off the screen. This is Schrader, the throw in. Backside help's been taken away. And then the key play in the basketball game. Watch the steal coming up right here. This is Banks is going to try to get it over midcourt. The score, as you can see right now, OG trails by one. There's the steal. In for the basket goes Schrader. That'll put them ahead. Let's look at it one more time. First of all, Banks does a good job of wrestling out of trouble right here. And as he crosses midcourt, here comes the double team. There's Knowlton with a strip. White throws it ahead like he's supposed to. And Schrader to the rim and scores. This put uh, the Titans up in the basketball game. They eventually won 55-51. Great basketball game. Yep. All right. Good job, Coach Shine, breaking those plays down. One more segment to go. We'll preview the games coming up this week right after this.
Welcome back. Our last segment looks at some preview games of games coming up, and I get to start off. Okay. Ottoville, they got a big weekend. They've oh, yeah. had a big season. They're 6 and 0 so far. And this Friday they play Lida, and then they play Delphi St. John's on Saturday night. Last weekend Ottoville beat Fort Jennings 65 to 57. Four players in double figures led by Logan Kemper. He had 22. Then on Saturday they turn around and beat Spencerville 54-39. Again, Logan Kemper had 17. So they're getting good scoring out of Logan and some help coming along. Elida, their Friday night opponent, 6 and 0. They play Van Buren tonight, so we'll see what their record is going into this game on Friday. But Daniel Unruh is the guy that leads him in scoring almost every time, or at least scores in double figures. But he's starting to get some scoring help. Isaac McAdams is stepping up. Dante Johnson is stepping up. Skylar Smith had a double-figure game over at St. John's. And so that will be a tough game on Friday. They turn right around and play the Blue Jays on Saturday. The Blue Jays stand at 3-2 and two right now. They have Van Wert on Friday, so they'll be coming off that game to play against Ottoville. Jared Wurst, he's shooting the ball well, as is his other teammates. Remember, they started off right. shooting the ball really poorly, right. trying to get those football legs out. Now it's starting to turn around a little bit, but Ottoville has a tough, tough weekend coming they up. They do. And at, at Delphi St. John's, that, that, I'm not sure what the records are. It doesn't matter. That's yeah, a big game that's anyway, yep. how those two teams yep. match up. Well, let's look at Shawnee Indians and the Marion local Flyers this weekend. Now, we, we've covered Shawnee some throughout the year. They're 3-2 and two going into a Tuesday night game with Perry. But if we've looked at the score and what the Shawnee Indians have done, they're kind of a Jekyll and Hyde type team. When they win, and again, they're 3-2 and two going into the nice game, they score 61 points a game and they give up 46. In their two losses, they scored 46 points a game and given up 61. It's just a complete opposite from each other. And of course, they're looking for some consistency. They would like to get Tyler Moore back from his leg injury. He's missed the last two weeks. He had that deep uh, thigh bruise. We're trying to get him healthy. That would help. Other than that, they've had nine different players who made a three-point field goal through the course of the year. So they get a lot of different balance scoring. They're kind of looking for that go-to guy right now to step up and play. And they're going down and play the Marion local Flyers. And we don't know a lot about the Flyers, Mark. We know they're 1-0. They defeated Salina last week, 66-38. That was their first game since winning the state football championship. They do have a Friday night game, which is a huge matchup. They have St. Henry, who's 4-0 on Friday night, so a big a MAC game right away to get that thing started for their weekend. Then they'll try to put it together on Saturday night for Shawnee. We know they have Nathan Bruns as one person at conference told me, you know what, he's a good quarterback, he's a better basketball player, <laughs> probably will go college somewhere to play his basketball career. Anyway, big matchup for both teams on, on Saturday night down at Marion Local. All right, Hopewell Loudon, a team from kind of north in our viewing yeah. area. They are 5-1 and 2-0 and and oh in the league, and they play at Pandora Gilboa, 5-0, and oh, also 2-0. and oh. Huge game in that league coming up. Hopewell Loudon on last Friday, they beat Arcadia 53-35. Jordan Jury would have been a stat stuffer yeah. if we wouldn't include him right, right here. 27 points and 4-3 Saturday, their only loss. They lost to Woodmore. 61-56. PG on Friday, they beat Riverdale 68-23. Drew Johnson, one of the really fine players in our area, had 23. Jared Brees, typically the second leading scorer, another really good basketball player, had 11. On Saturday, they beat Delphus Jefferson 67-42 again. Drew Johnson had 21 again. Jared Brees had 14. This time, Cooper McCullough came along and had 13. So they have get even scoring, but Drew Johnson's their go-to guy. Jordan Jury, if you're going to play for your coach, you got to be, and your coach is your dad, you got to be really, really good or not very good at all, but he's, he's really, really, really good. good. He yeah. is really good. He's a young player, too. He's going to have a, a fine career up there with them. Well, let's move on to Toledo Central Catholic and Lima Senior. This will be Friday night. It'll be a track game. Now, both of them have games to play before that particular time period, um, and then Toledo Central Catholic will host Salina on Saturday night. Lima Senior has a big game on Tuesday night. As they go to Toledo St. John's, that's been a war for the last several years, and the home team seems to win that game always. So that's a tough track game for Lima Senior to go to Toledo St. John's on Tuesday night. Uh, Toledo Central Catholic, they're currently 3-0 and right now, 1-0 and in conference play for T.J. Hunt. They're averaging 52 points a game. They give up 46. They're led in scoring by Dominic Cole and John Zell Norris. Last year, the Spartans had easy wins over Toledo Central Catholic by 30 once and by 12 the other time. And it won't be that easy this particular time. Of course, the Spartans are led by Brian Miller and Jaleel King as they uh, split last weekend in their QP Classic. Um, big game this weekend for Toledo Central Catholic at Lima Senior on Friday night. Hey, another Saturday night ball game. Fort Jennings at 2-2 two and two playing at Lincoln View, 4-1. and one. Fort Jennings last Friday lost to Ottoville 65-57, but Cole Horseman had 12 points and 8 rebounds, scored in the 20s in a couple other games this year so far. 
Crestview tonight, that's who they play. Then Ayersville on Friday. That's a couple of tough ones. Add that to Lincoln View. They got a tough stretch coming yeah. right now. Lincoln View beat Spencerville 46 to 40 last Friday night. Saturday, good win. They beat Wayne Trace 67 49. Three guys in double figures. Caden Ringwald had 20. Alec Bowersox had 16, including five threes. And they are at Grove Friday night before this Saturday night. For, uh, Fort Jennings game, so both of those have big weekends coming Big up. weekend. And we thought we'd look at this a little bit, too, because over the holiday break between Christmas and New Year's, a lot of high school tournaments in our particular area, so we thought we'd look a little bit at the tournaments. Of course, there's a big Coldwater tournament that comes up. All these are on December 29th and 30th. At Coldwater, you get Coldwater, Marion Local, St. Henry, and Salina. Ooh, there's a good tournament right there. Yeah. Parkway hosts a tournament now. It's Parkway, Grove City Christian, Graham, and Ridgemont. Bluffton has a tournament. This has been going on for years, although they've added a school this year. Bluffton, Miller City, kind of the new entry in that particular group. Corey Rawson in Arlington. And there's a tournament down in Waynesfield now, too. This is Waynesfield, USV, Ada, and Allen East. So four teams in kind of a proximity there. Those are all on the 29th and 30th. And for all of you guys who don't like winter weather, Toledo St. John's heads to a tournament in San Diego where they'll play three games and Toledo Whitmer goes to Florida. Well, they'll play three games down in Florida. Wow. Yeah. How about that? that that's something. We should volunteer that's to cover way. those. I know. <laughs> hey, we've got a right. second bright spot. Yep. Because it's the holidays and Christmas coming up, we like to show the, the crew here at uh, Closer Look their family. So we got some pictures yep. for you. There's, we're going to start off with my family. That's my go. crew. And uh, my son, Zach, Adam, and Kyle, their wives, Jill, Grace, and Chelsea, and seven grandkids, and not in this picture, but not long after that, you'd see Grace, the one in the middle, there in the blue shirt. She is now expecting our eighth grandchild, and so we will all be together this weekend, and I can't wait. One of the best uh. parts of Christmas is being with family. Let's throw up Coach Shine. All right, well, I don't know how we got this picture up here. I can tell you what, that lady in that picture has made one mistake in her adult life. <laughs> And that's who she married, that guy standing beside her. That's my I wife, do. Claudia. We were down at the Civic Center last week for a great event down at the Civic Center last week. And I appreciate all she lets me do and get out and get around. This is Dan, Amanda, and Alexander Zambrano. They live in Houghton in New York State in the Snow Belt area east of Buffalo. And they're going to be in Philadelphia. So we'll miss having Christmas with them and those three. And then are the four of them that just moved into our area. This is Nathan, Elizabeth. The bigger one is Ezra, the smaller one is uh, Isaac, and they live no north of Ada now. We'll all be together uh, some this Christmas holiday. That's a great thing for us. It sure is. All right, now the guys that really make it happen. <laughs> this is our director, Ben Reif, and his wife, Casey. And the one in the red is Jackson. And the little one being held by Casey is Ashton. And uh, boy, what would we do well, without Ben with all our basketball broadcasts? And when we came in today, the four of them were here. Oh, and that man. was great to see yeah. them live. That was that was good it was to see havoc too. in the hallway. I heard whining sure. going on. I wasn't sure whether it was Ashton or a high school basketball <laughs> coach, but we had <laughs> got spoken to hear that. like a true referee. There you go. All right, and then our executive producer Garrett Mansfield, and this is his fiance, fiance Carlina, and uh, we really appreciate Garrett putting all the stuff together and finding the pictures and the highlights and. They uh, make it very easy yeah. on you and I to come here and talk yeah. about basketball for a half hour every Tuesday afternoon. Merry Christmas to those guys and their families, and certainly to you uh, as well. All right, throughout the holidays, we've got more games coming your way. We're going to put up our broadcast schedule, and uh, if you're like me over the holidays, you, you really like seeing these games because you got a little extra time and you're just kind of hanging around the house a little bit more than normal. And there you go, December 23, a lot of Saturday games on Sunday, Christmas Eve, uh, a couple of more. And then on Thursday and Friday and Saturday of the following weekend before New Year's, you see some great games, uh, a couple of tournaments. Uh, Mark talked about the Coldwater Tournament. Elida Lima Senior, I know a lot of people point toward that game in this area. What a lot of great games coming up. We hope you have a great Christmas. We do. And a happy holidays. Good to see Merry you, Merry Christmas, my yes, man. Yes, sir. All right. We'll see you next week on A Closer Look.